Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We have the awesome virtual background here, and we've done away with the leg lamp. We have not done away with our great sponsors, or the hope that sometime real soon, Don Muller's uh, got a sore left arm right now. We're all going to get a shot, get the mask off, get back over to State Fair, where Don can work that French press and the chicken and waffles and the shrimp and grits. I was over at El Guapo grabbing some uh, carryout last week as well. Highly encourage you to do that. I'm about to go on a first citywide, then regionwide, and later statewide, and it's not even an election thing. I'm just going to be eating crab cakes. We're going to start at Fadley's next month with Damy Hahn, where I open that crab and all the people got the education about all that. We're going to get educated about crab cakes this year. And, Don, I know that uh, there's a spot in your belly for all of that, right? Oh, I'm, I'm sign me up for the uh, crab cake tour. And speaking of the crab cake tour, Nestor, when you talk about the first congressional district in the state of Maryland, there are some crab cakes in the first congressional district, and we have an individual who hopes to be the next congressman from the state of Maryland, from the 1st Congressional District, Heather Mazier. Heather, welcome to Baltimore Positive. Thank you so much. And uh, just a tiny correction, I'll be a congresswoman. Congress. Congresswoman. That's oh, Boy, <laughs> slap, 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 slap. You know what? It's, it's quite okay, Don, because here's the thing. We've never had one in the 1st Congressional <laughs> District, and there are no women serving in the Maryland uh, federal delegation. So I, I understand that we're not so used to it these days, but well, I'd be very honored to be the congresswoman from the 1st Congressional District. Well, and, when you do your, your crab cake tour, I, I'm not going to suggest you eat crab cakes. We don't so much put them in cakes out here on the shore. But if you want to come pick some crabs with me at Waterman's and Rock Hall, uh, we would have a, a beautiful day, obviously, uh, waiting for the moment when we can all do that safely. Again. So you don't you know go. the history here between Moeller and I, because we were together down at Fadley's two years ago. Don was my high school guidance counselor in 1982, okay? So there's a oh, lot so of relationships. so that's what went wrong And with he you. admonished <laughs> right, exactly. me for opening a crab the wrong way. He said, you're doing it wrong. I'm like, what do you mean I'm doing it wrong? So we got into this battle, and there was a video. Three million people have seen it. Just Google my name about the perfect way to open a crab. And so <laughs> I would love to see your technique at some point. First things first, I've heard your name mispronounced so many times that Mazir – um, it doesn't roll off my tongue because it's been so long of mispronunciation, kind of mm -hmm. like a bad golf grip. But I will say this, despite the fact of not pronouncing your name and congresswoman, congressman, I voted for you. So uh, <laughs> I do want you to know that. That's so, the most important part. You know, I always wanted to tell you that if I got you on a program that I voted for you. So um, obviously bringing this election in, first things first, just – uh, the, the, the Andy Harris thing sort of comes to all of us, and uh, it's a name we've brought up here in, in, in the past. Bringing yourself into this election and where you are, just give us the, the, where you've been the last couple of years. I know you're, you're hosting a wonderful podcast these days, right? I am, and uh, maybe more on that in a minute. I, 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 I appreciate the opportunity to just set up why it is I'm even running for Congress, because it certainly wasn't anything I thought I was doing. Some conversations I had with friends even in December were about a range of plans for 2021 that had nothing to do with running for Congress. And then January 6th happened. I was deeply emotionally traumatized along with a lot of the rest of the country at witnessing people who call themselves patriots taking up arms and other violent measures to break into our Capitol building and try to thwart the democratic process in a peaceful transfer of power on a, an election that all evidence showed was conducted freely and fairly. And that was encouraged by not just then President Trump, but by 100 and roughly 140 members of the House of Representatives that included my congressman, Andy Harris, in voting against this certification and perpetuating this big lie. That <clears throat> was a contrast that I really wanted to uh, take a stand to show a different approach, but it wasn't just the sedition and the insurrection, there were a range of things right one after another, including that very night 
He tried to pick a fist fight with a colleague that he disagreed with on the House floor. And then a week later was caught trying to carry a gun on the House floor. All of these things really uh, were a, a dividing line that was a step too far. We've disagreed on a range of policy issues the entire time. I've lived on the Eastern Shore. I've not been happy with my representation, but there's a, there was a, something very different that was awakened deeply inside of me that day that said, this can't go unchallenged. And I wasn't anticipating running for Congress, but I'm also very enthusiastically in this race. We're in it to win it. And I'm looking forward to talking to you about that today. Where was your life January 5th? What, what, what was going on in your world? Well, on January 6th, I was uh, here at the farm working in my studio. I'm, uh, I have a nonprofit organization that I lead called Soul Force Politics. And we are a, both a podcast and we do retreats before COVID and uh, webinars and, and courses on, on helping to um, look at how to bring an ethic of love into our civic engagement, on how to heal the division of us versus them, Republican versus Democrat, rural versus rural, uh, sorry, rural versus urban. And it's instead a conversation about what connects us. And, and within the context of that work is why I was so shocked that I'm being represented by somebody who's actually picking a fist fight with someone on the floor when we should be healing rather than finding ways to bridge the divide. So on that day, on January 6th, I was here in my studio. I was preparing for um, an upcoming series of courses that I lead. I'm teaching, I, I'm an anti-racism educator through my organization, and we have an eight-week unlearning racism course that we provide. And I had uh, set up uh, eight I'm sorry, three classes for over eight weeks. And I was working with people who were enrolling and asking questions about the course and uh, going back through some of the curriculum. And I was also watching the, the internet though, because I had followed for a few days leading into January 6th, some ramblings on more um, conservative spaces that were suggesting it was going to be a violent day. And I wanted to believe that that was just big talk, but I, I, I did have some concerns. And, and so I actually watched it unfold live in many ways from anticipating that there might be some unrest that day, but never in my wildest dreams was it going to be what it turned out to be. Well, Heather, we, this is one of those rare times. Nestor and I do our best to try to be fair and impartial, I guess, fair and balanced, I guess, to use the, the name of the demon network. Um, but this is one of those times when we are not able to do that. We, we have not in any way uh, been shy about expressing our opinions about the current resident who holds the, uh, the first congressional, uh, congressional seat. Uh, I I've mentioned before on this show, Heather, that when I was county executive, it was at the time when the Trump administration was putting children in cages, and there was a, a moment where there were reports that some of those children were being shipped to Baltimore County, and it was all very secretive. You could not get any information. And it seemed to me that as the chief executive of the county, I at least had a responsibility to those children to make sure they were safe. And I wrote the Secretary of Health and Human Services trying to get information as to where they might be in Howard, I mean, in Baltimore County, so that I could send our health department officials in to make sure that they were being cared for properly. At which point, that that question, that inquiry, which seemed about as mundane as any I could ever make, I'd like to check to make sure these children are okay, L led Andy Harris to putting out a press release and going on all the news to saying that Don Moeller as county executive of Baltimore County was creating a sanctuary county and it was outrageous and uh, basically called me every name in the book. And so he and I had a little back and forth and, and it's just you know, as you said, it's just deteriorated. But having said that, Heather, and God bless you, I, you know, I know that district pretty well. And it, it ain't the district that elected Wayne Gilchrist. And it ain't the district 
that elected Frank Craddeville. So I'm just going to cut to the chase. What would a, an unavowed progressive like Heather Mazier, what is the path to victory to end this nightmare in the first? <laughs> thank you for that question, Don. And I also want to thank you for your leadership in the role of county executive while you were there. And, and that's, you asked the right question that needs to be asked. It's a humanitarian question. And I, I sense that there are a lot of us in the first congressional district that are very much done with the politics of division and the, um, the efforts at taking the smallest issue and turning it into an inflamed uh, rhetorical, cultural war um, conversation that, again, continues to just keep us divided. I am also going to be running in a district that isn't the district that we have seen here in the last 10 years. It so happens to be that there will be redistricting that will apply to this legislative, uh, this congressional cycle as well. So the boundaries are going to look different. We don't know what they'll look like, but any redrawn boundary that wants to address the problems of gerrymandering in Maryland are going to absolutely have to impact the first congressional district. The reason why we have crazy looking maps like John Sarbanes uh, third congressional seat is because all the Republicans were put into the first district and to great to create more balance and get this district to be a little bit more um, what we anticipate it to to be natural rhythms of this region. Um, I think we're going to see a, a way more competitive district, but I want to be clear that even if these lines weren't being redrawn. I'm in it because there's a difference between, it's like, yes, there's a certain response and a bell that gets rung when the leadership that's being offered is suggesting to divide people over an issue that really is a humanitarian issue. And then there's an alternative of calling people to their highest selves and looking at the very same issue through a different lens. And I'm finding that there is some fatigue, uh, even in those who have been supportive of uh, their current representative in the past, there's a fatigue there that it suggests that they're open to a different conversation and, di and a different approach. And I'm running a general election strategy right out of the gate. Um, big tent coalition building has always been my approach. Even when I was in the General Assembly, I got unspeakable uh, bipartisan legislation passed by partnering up. I partnered with Mike Schmiegel from the Eastern Shore to pass uh, a family planning expansion bill. He's the head of the pro-life caucus, and I sat down with him to have a conversation about lowering the abortion rates in Maryland and improving maternal and child health. And he wanted to know what the catch was. And I said, well, it's an expansion of family planning. And normally that, that word in and of itself is a phrase that divides people, but it doesn't have to. When I showed him data and statistics that would um, have the abortion rate lowered by 3,000 a year through this expansion of uh, family planning services. And by giving women access to improved maternal and child health outcomes, it lowers the infant mortality rates for those of us who care about the lives after they're born as well. And there was a, a real beautiful synergy between us in saying, yeah, we can rise above the conversation that normally wants to separate us on these topics and actually get something done that is positive. And we passed that Family Planning Expansion Act and went on to partner. We, we became kind of the, the odd couple, the Annapolis odd couple, because we also worked together to decriminalize marijuana possession and a, a whole host of, of other initiatives. But uh, I think that kind of bipartisan um, uh, appeal is, is something that's resonating right now after a lot of um, weariness from the last four years of division. There's a lot of courage that has to be involved in doing that, though, right? I mean, because the Twitter ears, and as he, uh, Don always calls it the chattering class, they don't like it when 
they, they, they say they want bipartisan. Then when people actually work together, it's you're too left, you're too right, you're too <laughs> rhino, whatever it would be, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that 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 can be the case. And yet at the well, for, let me tell you one example. Uh, speaking of podcasts and, and that kind of feedback in 2017, I did an, a podcast interview with Andy Harris. And I interviewed him on Soul Force Politics to have a conversation. Um, it was the to set the background up the mass shootings and killings from Las Vegas had just happened. And I found myself incredibly frustrated that once again, and we were just going through the wash, rinse, repeat cycle of uh, thoughts and prayers and nothing getting done after a, a, a big um, violent situation like Too that. Too soon to talk about it the day after. <laughs> yeah. And so what I did was reach out to see if um, on the heels of having had a really beautiful conversation with Larry Hogan on my podcast and showing the, the heart space that I offer to someone who disagrees with me and how to have a civil dialogue, I asked if we could model how to have a conversation about um, the Second Amendment and the congressman agreed. And I went in with a, a very specific plan in mind, which was, let's start this conversation off connecting from a place of gratitude. The Haudenosaunee tribe, or sometimes better known as Iroquois, they're the founders of democracy, and they have always recommended that before tribal councils, before school starts, they start their day or their meetings with a Thanksgiving address where there's a shared gratitude. And when your minds come together as one in gratitude, you're less likely to start out in a place where you're fighting. And I offered that practice in this podcast with Andy Harris, really building the container for the conversation that would allow for us to really have compassion and curiosity for each other. And I went into it, not trying to convince him of the merits of one side or another, but are there overlapping areas of consensus where we can find some agreement on this so that the needle can move some. And, at, and we had a beautiful dialogue. And after I put that podcast out there, I heard from some people that said, damn it, Heather, you're the first person that's ever made me think of Andy Harris as a human being. He actually was nice and cordial and, and you made me want to like him in your podcast. And I said, good, I don't want you to not like him. Uh, and I'll do everything I can to continue to encourage some opportunities for, um, for growth here. Uh, the, and then he the took a gun into Congress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, you know, he didn't do anything with those ideas. He didn't try to advance it in any way. So I've, I've just been... Um, I've, do you feel I've patronized? Found, you know, no, no, I think it's just lackluster representation. Um, I'm, I'm an, uh, a really... I, I have a lot of fire in the belly, and I don't do anything partially. And I care deeply about making a difference and seeing that good things get done. And I think that this district is ready for a representation that really meets the moment instead of just kind of lagging back and getting by because you're in a safe district that you never have a really competitive challenger up against you. We're running a very different race from the get-go, and we're going to show that there's a, a very strong contrast while making it clear that this isn't just about defeating Andy Harris. This is about advancing our own positive agenda that, of what we believe is necessary for the first district to um, be best represented. Heather Mizer here. Uh, she is running for office again. And as I mentioned earlier, once voted for her without knowing how to pronounce her last name. Uh, <laughs> background check on you. I don't know when you came into my world, maybe through a city paper thing or something mm. like that. And I started reading and whatever. And then you pop up in the papers here and on the news a little bit, not a lot of it, but enough for me to, to, to know about you. Give me your trail of where you're from to how you got to Chestertown and, uh, you know, th this last sort of 15 years of your life. I would love to. I'm originally from a small rural farming community in the middle of nowhere, Illinois. It's called Blue Mound, population 1100. You have to drive about 15, 20 miles to get to a grocery store. I, um, the friendly heart of the Midwest. Yes, very much. Salt of the earth, we always say. And I, um, 
when I was in the legislature, I represented Tacoma Park and Silver Spring and from Montgomery County in, in the Maryland legislature for eight years before I ran for governor in 2014. And yes, the city paper, I even have it here in my studio. It says, can Heather Mazier ride Maryland's wave of progressive politics into the governor's, governor's office? And the, and the article was called The Quiet Revolution. And we, we ran an amazing race against all odds in 2014. Um, with that trademark courage that you're speaking of, of, of being really clear about what I believe and why I believe it while uh, having an open entree for lots of new and innovative ideas and a conversation that is open to everyone's opinions with curiosity. And after the um, election was over, I needed a little bit of time to retreat and recover from a really intense experience. And my wife and I moved to our farm in Chestertown. The quick story of how we ended up in Chestertown, we had a part-time home here since 2005. We came one weekend to visit friends that lived out here. I fell so in love with the town because of it reminding me where I grew up that we, within one week, had put an offer on and purchased a small cottage in town that was our weekend getaway uh, for a number of years until we bought our farm in 2011. It's really hard to manage a farm part-time and not live here all the time. And it's a lot of grass to mow. Huh? <laughs> a lot of grass to mow. A lot of there's life teeming here, and we were excited and really wanted to make this our our permanent home. And in 2015, we did that. So we've lived here full time for the last six years. And I have been running uh, Soul Force Politics since 2017, and doing a blend of uh, being um, a farmer I put sort of in quotes I'm from a fifth generation farming family so I'm very familiar with what it means to farm corn and soybeans and wheat like we're not doing that here this is a farmette so we're 34 acres we have only 10 tillable acres and what we grow are uh, organic herbs for my wife's clinical practice she's a, a clinician um, that uses herbal medicines um, but uh was not planning on running for Congress. And at the same time, I'm so infatuated and deeply in love with this land and the communities that surround us that I've been very excited to grow the relationships and networks throughout the rest of the district, uh, just in this short period of time where the enthusiasm has been so beautiful and strong already for the for my announcement. Don't get Don Moeller started on Chestertown, right? I get you started, right, Don? Oh, I, I like Chestertown. Washington College, watched a lot of lacrosse games there. Mm -hmm. Had a cousin who uh, lived there for, for many, many years. I'm very, very familiar with Chestertown. Heather, I want to back up to the district. You talked about the district. How problematic, and I know you're in regardless, but how problematic to your planning because I know one of your reputations is you're a planner, and as you said, you're, you're going at this with everything you have. How problematic is it that the census data is now going to be delayed, which is now going to push uh, redistricting out of this session, either into a special session or early next year, literally months before people run? Mm. I don't have a problem with it whatsoever. I'm... Uh my decision to get in this race, you're right, I am a planner. And I very uncharacteristically decided I was in this race without necessarily having that plan. I'll take you back to one moment. On January 7th, I tweeted at Andy Harris that if he didn't resign, I would consider retiring him myself in 2022. And that came from this strong place of just being done, just being done with him. And then there was this wave of response where people were not, I mean, when I tweeted it, there was maybe a little thought in the back of my mind that I would maybe be willing to run against him. But it was also like my, my working to retire him doesn't have to be that I'm running for office. It could be supporting really super strongly and just putting all my effort into whomever, right? And it, the response from the presumption that I was toiling with the idea of running for office was so overwhelming that I really had to be serious about it pretty quickly. And I toggled between 
excitement and nausea in the beginning stages, excitement at what I felt was a really important moment calling me back into public service and some nausea at not really wanting to turn my life upside down, loving the rhythms of my work at the farm and soul force politics and just still having a short memory of, of the intensity of giving yourself entirely to the birth of, of what is a campaign. It's its own child. Right. And I was talking with my wife over coffee about my frustration at the lack of clarity because I'm usually so very clear about what I'm supposed to do. I rely on her in so many ways, and she's a beautiful spiritual partner of mine. And she asked me a very important question. She said, Heather, on your deathbed, if you don't do this, how will you feel? And instantaneously, I had tears rolling down my face that I realized that I was placing resistance to something that my soul was very clear about, that I already knew that I was being asked to do this at a very deep level, and that I needed to stop coming up with all the reasons why I shouldn't. And with that clear, with that came, came the clarity, like everything else started to fall away. And then I started to see the way that the, that the work I'd been doing for four years at Soul Force Politics was uniquely preparing me for this moment, that what people are hungry for right now is dignified leadership that knows how to bring us together. And I only later, when I, when my planning side, when my brain started to engage to catch up to my heart, did I start to really think about what the district lines looked like and the fact that there would be redistricting. And the, the data coming late means that the maps probably won't get redrawn until the end of the year. And as you mentioned, um, not approval until the beginning of next year. Ultimately, that's good for me because there are a lot of people that talk a big game about wanting to be a member of Congress, but I don't like to lose and I want the safe bet and I want to know exactly what the district lines look like and I want to know that it's safe for me. By The, the time people without courage. Yes. By the time that's clarified, I'm going to have so much money and so much support and so many endorsements. Like It's just not even an option for the people who are looking for certainty. I have the certainty in my belly and deep within me that knows that this is the right moment for me to be here doing this and to, to have my pulse on where the district is trending in its uh, consciousness and what message they are ready for this go around. And so I'm feeling really confident. I talked Heather, on a couple years ago, this podcast thing from politics was going to catch on. Um, you're doing this as sort of a, a stepladder in, you know, keeping your voice alive and your thoughts alive and, uh, and your message alive. Tell me about your podcast a little bit and, and how that is going to work over the next 18 months for you. Actually, that is interesting because I'm, I'm deeply ethical and I believe in having uh, and following probably to the extreme, not just the letter, but the spirit of the law and everything I need to do to keep a, a hard fence between my work at Soul Force Politics and my role as a campaign for, as a candidate for Congress. Um, so my work in Congress can refer to the to the work I have done over at Soul Force, but never do I mention or talk about on the Soul Force side the fact that I'm even a candidate. And as far as the podcast goes, um, here and there when something comes forward that is um, in in relationship to the work of Soul Force, but having nothing to do with the campaign, you'll see me cut another show. Um, but it's also likely that I'm uh, going to look to set up a separate podcast that would just be um, from the campaign that would be the opportunity for me to use this platform. So Canada it would be Heather, it, citizen Heather. exactly very different than than the Soul Force podcast, which is a, a different a different thing. A, a, a couple of other political questions, Heather, it gets back to how you win, because those of us who share your vision, your, your importance of this district, and, and this district 
the, the representation there now is so out of touch with who we are as Marylanders, I think you will resonate with, with a lot of people. The, the Cook political report, the last time I looked, had this as a plus 14 Republican district. I think 538 has it as 1.1. So for those people who are out there who aren't nerdy about this stuff, it means on the Cook side, it means that it outperformed national Republican performance in presidential elections by 14 points. In other words, it's extremely, extremely Republican. I think it was the 90th most Republican district in the nation. That may change some, but when Heather Missouri so shows up at the the, the 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 corn roast or the pig roast or the or the crab feast and you're in the midst of people who have an affinity for Donald Trump. Give us the stump speech. Give us the the Heather Mazir, Mazir up close and personal. Why that person could be convinced that it's time to move on from Andy Harris. <laughs> well, one thing I'd like to um, uh, point out is that uh, I think that this district is um, very much in touch with authenticity. And when I was a candidate for governor, even though I was running in a primary at the time, I went on conservative talk radio consistently. And the callers would call in and pretty regularly have a message that went something like this. You know, Mazir, I don't agree with you on a damn thing, but you're honest. I can tell you're speaking what you really believe in, and I feel like I could trust you. And I think that we tend to, in armchair politics, uh, uh, armchair quarterbacking of politics, tend to think that um, it really does come down to certain uh, labels and um, what your positions are on things. People can tell a lot about you fairly quickly in engaging with you and talking to you. Am I looking at you in the face and connecting from a heart space where I really care that you don't have access to a primary care provider and that you're worried that you can't protect your farm without having a gun and someone told you that Heather Mazir wants to take it away, I'm very willing to have that conversation and to assuage those fears, not because I'm spinning them or a slick politician that's wanting to get their vote, but because I really care about connecting and having a genuine dialogue that will result in our sense of community being brought back together again instead of being pulled apart. I had a Republican businessman who owns two manufacturing plants, one in our district, reach out to me. He sought me out to have a conversation because he was deeply shaken by what happened on January 6th. He said, I don't think I can come so far as to support you, but I don't know. But I will tell you, and we, when, we had our, when, when, I, when we had our conversation, he went into further explanation to tell me that he had voted for Donald Trump both times. And over the course of our dialogue on a whole host of topics, some areas where we found some consensus, some others where we agreed to disagree, at the end of that phone call, he and his wife both agreed to be maximum contributors to my campaign. Now, I know that's just one anecdote I'm sharing with you in a short podcast interview, but it gives you the sense of um, how different things are on the ground than how we, we tend to paint them. Now, I'm not saying that that doesn't mean that in the beginning there'll be some places where my outreach will be rebuffed. And I also am completely confident at going into these spaces. Um, I don't. I don't approach the world from a place of um, guilt and shame. And uh, I, had a, I had a woman reach out to me yesterday to have a conversation. She says, I'm a um, black conservative Christian, but I'm interested in your campaign. I have seen you talk about faith in really personal ways that I find attractive 
but I'm also still on the learning scale on uh, LGBT issues. And would you be willing to talk to me? And while we were talking, she just said, I can't tell you how freeing this is to be able to be honest with you about where I'm still learning or even in disagreement with you. And you're, you're holding it with so much love and compassion and really giving me space to learn and talk and, and, and still hold my position, but you're not judging me. I can't, I can't overemphasize how, while that's a very standard way that I interact with people, it's catching people by surprise because I'm learning that that's not how a lot of people interact with each other. Yeah, they're, not, they're, not, they're not used to that. That kind of, uh, you know, it's interesting, Heather. I, I've said whether it's elected officials I've worked for, those that I've consulted with over the years, the one thing I think you're alluding to, and you can't teach it and you can't learn it, and that is genuineness. And I believe folks understand, and, and whenever I'm trying to evaluate a candidate, whether I want to work for them, not work for them, is whether or not they're genuine. Because it's not something that can be acquired. And it seems to me, I hear that coming through loud and clear in, in what you're saying. The other thing, it's interesting you mentioned, I, I do, because it's easy to think we're not making progress at times. And I think you're a great example of some progress. And, and feel free to blow this up if I'm off base here. But I go back to when you ran for governor, 2014. <laughs> In terms of not bearing the lead, I think every paragraph began with, Heather Mazur, openly gay member of the Maryland General Assembly, Heather Mazur, openly gay member. And now that was, that was kind of a big thing in 2014 that this openly gay member of the General Assembly would run for governor. Now, as you prepare to run for Congress in 2022, not so much, right? I mean, I, it seems, to, is that right? I mean, I'm looking at it. We obviously had a presidential candidate. You talked about going on conservative talk radio. Certainly, uh, Mayor Pete was very comfortable on Fox News, probably the, the number one Biden surrogate on Fox News. But it seems to me that maybe that's progress, that every article won't begin now with Heather Mazier, openly gay member of the Maryland General <laughs> Assembly. Are we, are we gaining on it? <laughs> Absolutely. I think that the other places that we are um, gaining on is um, a recognition that um, mm, I am so sorry. I just completely uh, forgot where I, there was a different point, not about gayness. That well, I, I do this make. professionally. Oh. It happens every day. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. It's called getting, it's called over 50. I got an excuse now. <laughs> I'm I'm almost there. <laughs> there it goes. All right, perfect. Um, it'll come back to me in a minute. But yes, being gay is. Oh, I know. It it wasn't. Sometimes it wasn't being gay. Sometimes it was Heather Mazier who wants to legalize marijuana, and like that was some big awful thing. Like it cost. It cost right. me quite openly. Cost me the endorsement of the Baltimore Sun. They, they said she's the candidate that's run the best campaign, that has the best platform, that has inspired, you know, more people than we can think of in previous campaigns. But on the issue of wanting to legalize marijuana, she's gone too far. And sometimes the challenge for me in the past has been that the things I see and I'm interested in championing are about on a time horizon that are like four years or so ahead of where a lot of the rest of the country is and that can sometimes put you in like a liberal category I'm not liberal I'm just actually seeing where it is we're headed towards and catching on and 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 I'm a pioneer in advancing new ideas and that can be seen as being liberal but there can also be some really awesome conservative aspects to that too and in the case of legalizing marijuana i mean like almost every position that i advanced in that 2014 campaign that was seen as radical became mainstream by 2018 what feels nice and different this time and maybe it's because i was so unexpected in 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 planning to do this there was no plan uh, i feel right with time 
for the first time in my political career. I feel like I'm meeting a moment that is ready for me rather than, oh, shoot, here I go again, advancing something four years before people are ready to actually get to that space. And that feels good. I don't mind being the pioneer and coming up with the approaches that are carving uh, um, possibilities for for that catch up <laughs> and it well, you didn't really... mind taking the arrows to come along with being the pioneer right not at all not at all um why do any of this if you're not going to be fierce and bold and creative and energetic and innovative and and at the same time compassionate loving open-hearted uh, it's like that blend. I understand. I'm 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 super unique in that way. You really people want to put labels on me, and they they don't exactly work. Yeah, you know, I'm liberal on some things. I'm conservative on other things. I'm. Uh, what are you conservative about? What What's going to appeal to someone in your conservativeness? Well, I live my own personal life incredibly conservatively. And that allows me to have a, an understanding of where some people come from who want to project that conserva conservative approach into a policy sphere where we tend to separate ourselves is the choices I make for how I live my life are not choices I want to um, require others to live by. So I've always been um comfortably able to talk about my support for uh reproductive rights and access to uh the full range of health care for a woman to choose on her own with her own um conscience and relationships whether or not a pregnancy is considered a life to her in those early stages or not while simultaneously holding a very deep Catholic, personal, religious perspective on what choice I would make. Um, but it's my choice. And I am not about requiring that to be um, the law for everyone. And there's, I think, in the blending of those two is sometimes where those concentric circles can overlap that too often it's each side not really understanding where the other side is coming from and a lot of my positions are coming from this unique place of me living conservatively my own life and understanding from a broader more liberal perspective um, what the laws and regulations should be in in encouraging the space for us to interact with that. Well, I hope when we get together again, my video synced up, right? Because I know I've been all over the place here from the beginning of the Zoom. Heather Mizear joining us here. She's going to run in the first against Andy Harris. Uh, Don, uh, if you've got any parting shots, bring them on now. I'll just say I'm happy I voted for you. Leave it at that. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. No, I, my, my, my one parting shot before we get out of here and wish you nothing but, but good luck. And Heather, hopefully we can come back throughout the campaign over the next 18 months or so to get updates and keep us abreast of the issues. But what did you learn um, from running for governor six years ago that's going to be the most helpful now as you go forward? Mm, not to take things so personally. I definitely had a little bit of um, what I would have called a, a broken heart when the election was over on my frustration that certain groups or people who would privately tell me I was the best candidate and that they wanted to endorse me but just couldn't um, being allowing that to have a little bit of a personal impact on me and my spirit and I have come to understand more in my own spiritual journey and in the time I've spent after the election and in recognizing like that never had anything to do with me. I never needed to take any of that personally. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it, it was reflective on where people were at the moment and the pressures they were under within the system to do things the way it always been done, all that. 
And there's a, I've been much more on a, a path to freedom and liberation in that regard and like not having um, the ego hold you back in the way that it can often in politics. And that's why you see me being so free and willing to be courageous and having these unique conversations and dialogues with people because I'm not, I'm not in my own imprisoned ego about everything. And that allows for a, a very different kind of um, engagement with people that is refreshing, that is catching a spark, and is um, going to continue to have people scratching their heads for quite a while. There's going to be a lot of assessment when all is said and done on how we won this thing. And I'm kind of looking forward to uh, seeing how all of that gets talked about in the postmortems. So now you've got people all excited out there before Nestor takes us out of here. They're driving around. They're sitting at their computer. They say, I'm in. I want to get involved. How do they follow you? How do they get in touch? Where, where do they connect with the Mazir campaign? Oh, bless you. It's uh, on the website is Heather Mazir, M-I-Z-E-U-R.com. We have a huge Facebook following um, under Heather Mazir for Maryland, and I post there regularly. My social media is always me and my own voice. Twitter at Heather Mazier as well. Thank you so much. I like the Roosevelt Truman behind you too. I'm out on the website <laughs> right now. So well done. Uh, I promise I'll try to get my zoom together next time so we can look at my lips moved in the same direction. Heather Mazier, you can find her at heathermazier.com. And of course, on behalf of former Baltimore County executive, Don Moeller and all of our friends at State Fair and El Guapo and Fagley's and Moeller and Gary Realty, where I'm going to get Jeff on the program next week. We're going to talk some real estate as well. We are WNST.net AM 1570 and Baltimore Positive.